Come on in, take a seat. All right, lovely people. Welcome back from lunch. I hope you really enjoyed your barbecue or your march or whatever it was that you got involved in. Um, now, for this afternoon, starting off in this section, we've got Sage Wheel, who's from Red Hat. He's been working with them for about four years, but he's been working on SAF for about 14 years. Please make him feel welcome. Thank you. Um, right, my name is Sage. I've been working on SAF for a long time. Um, and I'm going to tell you about our latest release, Luminous, and what all is new. Um, so a bit of a plan, I'll give you a, a, a small bit of background about Ceph, what it is. I'm going to talk about our Luminous release, which just came out um, last few months. Um, and then all the things that we've done recently to make it easier and more consumable for users. Um, simplifying, automating, and um, enabling management. And then I'll give you a bit of a preview for Mimic, our next release that's coming up this spring. Um, so how many people here um, have heard of Ceph? How many people use Ceph? All right, that's pretty good. Um, so Ceph is an object block and file storage system in a single cluster. Um, all components are designed to scale horizontally. So you can take commodity components, add new nodes, expand your cluster, and it'll distribute your data, handle it all for you. Um, it's meant to be hardware agnostic, to run on commodity hardware with no single points of failure. Um, critical thing is that in order to scale a system, it needs to be self-managing wherever possible so that the amount of management that you do isn't proportional to the size of the cluster. Um, and perhaps most importantly, um, Ceph is free and open source software um, because nobody should be forced to buy a proprietary storage system in order to solve their business problems. Um, so Ceph is a lot of things. Um, so how many people in here think that Ceph is hard? It's hard to use. Yes, so you're not the only ones. Um, sort of a recurring theme, the thing that we hear out there is that, that Ceph is a, is a difficult system to use. It's hard to understand, it's hard to run, it's hard to operate. Um, and for a long time, um, I at least kind of ignored this because distributed systems are hard and when you're managing a big complicated system, there's some inherent complexity and it's sort of difficult to make that go away. Um, but what we sort of realized, or I realized over the past year is that that was a real problem. That um, if you go back to what we were trying to accomplish, having the system be self-managing wherever possible and sort of hide all the details of the complexities of distributed storage. When people are saying Ceph is hard, what they're really saying is that we're not doing our job. We're not actually achieving the goal that we set out to do. Um, so we had a real sort of shift um, in our mindset, in my mindset, um, about a year ago, realizing that this was a core problem and that we needed to make a big pivot in order to address the situation um, to make Ceph easier. Because that was ultimately what was going to enable people to deployed in more environments, and replace proprietary systems with open systems. Um, so we realized that we must, we must make it easy in order for it to be successful. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk a bit about Luminous, which is our most recent release. Um, Luminous is our best release. It's beautiful. Um, just like this amazing picture of a Luminous squid, its namesake that I sort of blatantly ripped off the web. Um, Luminous has a lot of good stuff in it. Um, every Ceph release is sort of strictly better than the last in terms of features and stability, but I think Luminous is the release I'm most proud of because of all the new um, and important functionality that we crammed in in that, in that particular release. Um, so at the, at the Rados level, which is sort of the core internal object storage infrastructure that manages all your data, um, we added a lot of really important new functionality. Um, there's Blue Store, which is a completely new backend for the OSD object storage daemons that manages the disk drives. Um, so instead of sitting on top of a file system like XFS, we own the device directly and we can be much faster and much better. Um, we added full data checksums and in inline compression, lots of other good stuff. The performance is way better. Um, we also added erasure co um, coding overwrites. So Ceph has had erasure coding support for many years, but it was sort of a pend only, which meant it could only be used with certain workloads for um, object storage. Um, but with this release, you can use it directly for block and file storage as well. Um, which is sort of a big important thing for um, my phone is ringing <laughs> my wife call her back later um, which is very important for the total cost of ownership when you're deploying a cluster when you don't have to have three times as much storage for your raw data um, you can only do one and a half times or whatever it is um, there's a new component called Ceph manager that improves the um, scalability of the cluster by offloading certain functions off the monitors um, it improves our ability to extend and improve usability and so forth. I'm going to talk a lot about manager later. Um, there's a new messenger layer, which is sort of the network component um, that's 
uses much fewer resources, much easier to use, um, and more stable. And then on the object front, we added metadata search, um, integrating with Elasticsearch, which is pretty, pretty important. Um, compression and encryption support. There's a new NFS gateway that lets you easily import and export data from the object gateway. Um, on the block side, there's finally um, HA iSCSI support. Um, iSCSI has been around for a long time, but having it properly do HA with reservations and dealing, doing all the right things in a failover situation took a long time. And on the file system side, we finally have scale out metadata servers so you can scale out your file access um, and so on. Um, so lots of good stuff in Luminous. Um, it turns out, though, that that, um, that came at a bit of a cost. Um, so the way that we used to do Ceph releases, um, we did them roughly every six months, and every other release was an LTS release. Um, so you'll notice that um, Kraken followed Jewel by six months, and Luminous should have come out in the spring. It actually came out in the summer, and actually at the very end of the summer, because we sort of had this realization and pivoted and tried to fix a lot of usability issues at the end there. Um, but it, and we also did this even odd thing where only every other release was an LTS release instead of a release, which caused a lot of confusion for distributors and for users as far as which releases they should be running. Um, and so we simplified all that um, sort of going forward so that we're going to have a new release cadence that's every nine months, more like clockwork instead of when we thought it was ready. Um, um, and every release would be LTS. We'd backport um, all our fixes for two releases, so 18 months. Um, and you could always upgrade either one or two releases at a time. So we try to simplify the situation and make it easier to understand. Um, it also means that hopefully we won't have sort of the, um, the terrible <laughs> problem where Kraken, our best name Ceph release, was one that not very many people got to run. Um, hopefully we won't have that type of situation come up in the future. Um, so sort of the first theme that we addressed um, when we're looking at usability is trying to simplify the system and make the, the information that we're presenting to the user um, more reasonable and more accessible. Um, and this starts with a lot of just sort of the basic stuff. So um, a simple example of where Ceph is a bit overwhelming for users is the Ceph-S command, which is a simple status showing me the status of the cluster. This is what it used to look like. Um, you'll notice there's like a whole bunch of symbols and numbers in there. And it's telling you the, the health is okay, but then it's giving you like all the IP addresses in a weird format for the monitors, which you don't usually care about when you're checking the health. It tells you what these E numbers are epic numbers for the internal map structures. Um, all kinds of crap that you like really don't need to see when you're just trying to see, how's my, how's my cluster doing? Is it okay? Um, so in Luminous, we sort of restructured and trimmed this down. So you sort of break the information into information about the cluster and the overall health status, um, the services that are running, what the demons are, whether they're up or down, without all these sort of epic numbers polluting things. Um, and then information about the data that you're storing. So how many um, pools, logical pools you have, what objects are in the system, what your raw usage is on the raw storage devices, um, and a little bit of the internal state about the placement groups, um, which tells you whether their things are available or not. As part of this, we also revamped the, the health warning infrastructure. Um, so it used to be that whenever there was any sort of internal state that wasn't quite right, we'd just sort of raise a health flag and, and send a warning, and they're all sort of ad hoc, and they're exposing all these sort of internal bits and pieces of the system. Um, and so you'd have a degraded peering, recovering, recovering weight, sort of unclear to a user what those really mean. Um, and so in Luminous, we sort of reduce this down to sort of the key things that users care about. Um, in this case, we're in a health warning state because your data redundancy is degraded. That's the thing that actually matters in the real world. Um, and it turns out it's because of all those other things, but we sort of hide those internal deta details behind something that is um, usable and actionable. Um, and importantly, these, these health warnings um, have attached to them um, individual codes that aren't actually available in, that, in there, but there's, a, there's actually a health code um, that you can go Google and look up in the docs and determine exactly what it means. Um, similarly, the cluster logs before were sort of a, um, regularly the system spamming you with like what the internal state is and just dumping it out because that was the most convenient thing for the developer at the time. Um, but it was a wall of text that was very hard to, to parse and, and make sense of. Um, in Luminous, it's, it's much reduced. You get a warning when a health check fails. Um, in this case, degraded data redundancy, and there's a specific code associated with that, PG degraded, so you can go read in the docs exactly what that means and also what actions you should take in order to correct that, that state. You'll get periodic updates um, as the, and the little message associated with that changes, you know, how degraded it is. And then finally, when things um, become healthy again, you go to a message that says, this health warning is now cleared, it's back to normal, and you get a, a final message that says everything is healthy and it's okay. Um, so much sort of simplified, information community to the user and making sure that it's information that is actionable so that the user can figure out what to do next instead of you know, looking through mailing lists archives or something like that. 
Configuration um, was another big challenge um, in, in Ceph. Um, there are over 1,400 configuration options in the system um, with a minimal documentation. So the important ones show up in the, in the actual docs, um, but for the rest of them, you actually have to go look in a header file at the comment next to the thing that defines the configuration option to see what it means. Um, this is clearly not ideal. It's a mix of options that users should set, a mix of advanced options that are really constants that we didn't want to hard code, and then a mix of things where developers had this thing so they could inject a failure so they could test some particular component. Um, so it's very hard for the user to know what they should be looking at or touching. Um, so in Luminous, we sort of revamped the whole configuration infrastructure. Um, so there's a, there's a schema associated with objects, objects um, what the, or with options, what the type is, what its minimum and maximum values are, um, what it's for, what the description is, and that's all compiled in. So at any point, the, the, the programs itself could tell you what that option means. We could generate documentation from it. Um, and also, options had a level associated with them. So you could tell whether it was a, a basic option that a user should care about, an advanced option where you should tread carefully, really understand what it is before you change anything, and then developer options that you shouldn't touch because they're there for testing or for development. Um, <clears throat> we also added some commands to make it easy to tell what the running configuration was. Um, instead of dumping all of these 1,400 options and trying to figure out which ones you changed, it would tell you just the ones that were non-default, so it was sort of just the information that you needed. Um, and some other things, like certain settings were, um, were tuned in terms of the number of objects in the cache instead of the number of bytes and memory it would um, produce. So we changed a lot of things around so you could say, I want the metadata server to consume you know, four gigabytes of RAM instead of 10,000 thingamajigs. Um, and so that sort of streamlined, made it easier and more understandable for people who are trying to operate the system. Um, coming in the next version in Mimic, we're taking this a step further. Um, currently, um, these config options are set via um, INI-style config files that are put on every node of the system. Um, this introduces all sorts of management issues where you need to use um, either manually distribute these files everywhere or use um, tools like Chef or Puppet or Ansible or whatever to distribute these across nodes. And um, that can be pretty tedious and annoying, for, especially for somebody who just wants a storage system that works. Um, also, people don't like INI files. Or JSON is a new thing, so um, it was sort of made the, feel, the system feel antiquated. Um, and so in Luminous, um, we changed that so that the config options are all managed by the system itself on the monitors in sort of an internal database. So there's a, there's a new set of interfaces to set and observe what the configuration options are. And when you set an option, it does um, validation of the values at that time, so you'll get an error if you try to set a bogus value without finding out later that it doesn't work. Um, you can make these changes at runtime. So if you have a running cluster and you want to change an option, you just set it and everybody will discover that change and alter their behavior accordingly. You don't have to go distribute files and restart daemons and all this other random stuff. It makes it very easy to answer questions like uh, what option X is set to on particular daemon Y, if you want to understand what introspect what the system is actually doing at that time. There's a command to sort of import your old configuration files into this new database to make it easy to make that transition. Um, and at the end result is that the ceph.conf file is only really needed for bootstrap. And only sometimes. So you really only need just enough information to find out who your monitors are in order to, for the daemon to start up and join the cluster and then get everything else. Um, and it turns out you can actually do that piece through um, DNS SRV records, which is sort of an obscure feature that was added recently. Um, so it's actually possible to run a Ceph cluster where the environment completely determines how the daemon starts up and joins the cluster. So you can have this sort of very zero comp style um, environment simplifying your deployment. Um, other things, um, we simplify the way that you set up authentication keys. Um, there's a sort of a very extensible, rich framework for determining what a user is allowed to do in the system, but it's also very hard to understand and hard to use. And you'd always have to like go Google the docs to find out what the right string is to put in the capabilities to allow a particular thing to happen. So we've created some new commands that make it very easy to set up um, authentication permissions for, or authorization pr um, permissions for um, common things like an RBD user who just needs to use block devices, or for a user that needs to access CephFS, CephFS that they only need to access to certain pools associated with that file system and so on. All that stuff is sort of wrapped, hidden in behind a, a simple CLI or API command. Um, upgrades are a, are a common challenge um, with these systems where you have you know, a zillion daemons that are spread across a lots of hosts um, and figuring out if, how your upgrade is going, if they've all been restarted yet, um, so there are other simple things like commands that tell you what versions are running in a nice summary so you can identify if your upgrade is completed yet or not or what, what version you have, which daemons still have to be upgraded. Um, similarly, um, as Ceph evolves over time, there are new features that are added um, in 
in Crush in particular, and also in other parts of Rados where um, only newer clients are able to, um, only newer clients support the new features. And before you can sort of start using those new features, you have to make sure all the clients are upgraded um, because you'll break compatibility with old clients when you do that. Um, <clears throat> and so we've added a couple things to make that process easier. Um, there's a new way that you can sort of declare to the cluster what your compatibility level is. So you can say, this is the oldest version of client I want to support. And it says, OK. And it'll prevent you from changing other settings that break that compatibility. Um, and then there's also a command that lets you look at everybody who's currently connected to the system and see what version they are. So if there's some random machine in your environment that's running an old kernel with um, you know, hammer error um, features, um, it won't, you don't want to set your minimum compatibility to Joule because you're going to break that client. And in fact, the system will prevent you from doing it if it, any of these clients are currently connected. So trying to sort of streamline a lot of these, these pitfalls that, that users typically run into. Um, so the next theme is, is automating things away. So again, we want to make storage easy and take care of a lot of the, um, the details for you. So there's a bunch of easy stuff that we sort of knocked off the list. Um, you know, people with misconfigured um, large frame support in their switches, very hard to debug because the ping messages are small and so they don't actually trigger the error. You know, it's only when the system's under load that is a problem. So we made our, made our ping messages big so these things would be detected early. Um, small clusters, making sure they don't mark things out when they shouldn't. Um, we have default values that we sort of reevaluated all the defaults, um, and we have different defaults whether the device is on a hard disk or an SSD. So the system will just always come up with sort of our best estimate of what the, the right default values are for various tunables. So you don't you don't really need to do a lot of performance tuning anymore, um, or you shouldn't. If you do, you should tell us because <laughs> we probably will tell you that you're wrong, or we'll want to make it do it automatically. There's also a new tool for provisioning disks that's. Uh, much easier to use and, and does things like set up DM cache for you if you're doing tiering. Um, or soon it'll support in this new thing in the kernel called VDO that does compression and dedupe on a single device. It's pretty slick. Um, things like that. Um, but the big change that happened was there's a new daemon in Ceph called Ceph Manager. That's a new core Rados component that um, is sort of a peer of the monitors and OSDs. Um, it's written in C++, so it's a native Ceph daemon. It talks natively to all the others. It's mandatory. It's part of the cluster. Um, but it's not part of the data path. So if it goes down, you won't be able to like get your instrumentation and stats about how what the usage is, but the data path will still work. So it's not a truly critical component, but it is mandatory. Um, but the key thing is that it's, it's enabled to host Python modules that implement management functionality in a very easy way um, to automate cluster functions. Um, it was initially added in Kraken, but as, as of Luminous, it's sort of a, a core part of the system that, that's um, Important. And the reason why is that um, the monitor daemons and Ceph, which are sort of the central gatekeepers of the system, um, are not really a good home for, for high level management. They're all written in C. They're very important for making the system work and be and stay up. Uh, performance is important. Um, and also, the monitor, when it persists state, it does it using Paxos in a very sort of expensive and consistent and careful way. Um, and that wasn't a good fit for things like, you know, how many bytes are stored in the system. And so that can give you a DF value. It doesn't need that level of consistency. Um, so Ceph Manager has sort of a fast asynchronous view of the cluster state that it can expose to the modules and to users. Um, um, and, it, and it reduces the, the overhead of the Ceph Monitor daemon. So um, after we released, or while we were finishing up Luminous, we did a test at CERN on more than 10,000 disks across, I don't know, I think it was like 40 petabytes of storage. We built this big cluster, and we did a bunch of testing of the sort of the new architecture and showed that a lot of the scalable, scalability issues that we'd seen before in previous versions of Ceph um, we're gone because we'd moved all the statistics management off to the manager daemon. Um, so that was a big win. Um, the manager architecture sort of subscribes to some state from the monitor, so it has a local copy of this, the state of the system. Um, some of the CLI commands go to the monitor, depending on what they're doing, and some of them go to the manager, depending on whether you're, you're doing like a DF, it goes to the manager. Um, other things go to the monitors. Um, but the key thing here is that you have the sort of Python framework that lets you write modules um, that can implement new management functionality. And these are like very easy to write, um, and they can do a lot of really, really powerful stuff, including implementing new CLI commands. So you can extend Ceph in a way that you couldn't do that before. Um, so these, these are easy. Um, they're robust in that you can do a lot of stuff. You can send commands to the monitor to control the cluster. Um, you can have long running processes. You can run web servers in modules. And in fact, you do. Um, and the nice thing about them is that they're sort of packaged and distributed with Ceph. They're part of the system. Um, and Ceph handles all the sort of gory details of like making sure they're up, there's always a running manager. Um, 
if the, the manager fails, it'll bring up another manager. Um, there's, your module will always come up. So all, a lot of this sort of detail that used to have, if you're building an out-of-tree or separate component trying to do this, it's handled for you. So you can just focus on the, the core functionality that you're trying to do. Um, so one of the first modules that I implemented was one called um, the balancer. Um, the way that Ceph distributes the data, it sort of randomly sprays data across um, the devices. Um, and if you sort of a property of the statistics and mass involved uh, is that you end up with sort of a normal distribution of what the utilizations of devices are. So some, some disks will be a little bit more and a little bit less full than the average. And so you get the sort of bell curve. And the problem is that as your, as your cluster gets really big, you're going to have more and more outliers where uh, some, a few OSDs are way more full or way less full than the average. And this can be a problem because um, you need to make sure there's space on all the devices. Um, and so what the balancer does is it does a statistical analysis of that distribution and it tweaks the weight so that it tightens that distribution so you have um, OSDs that are all sort of have the same utilization and you can fill your cluster up closer to full. Um, and the nice thing is that it was designed to be really easy. So there's a single command that you just say turn balancer on and it will run in the manager regularly sort of checking the distribution of the cluster and make sure everything um, is balanced as well as possible. Um, and if you, if you don't want that level of automation, you can go use a, a second set of commands that are sort of let you look at individual stages of that process. Um, and you can see what its plans on doing and so on. Um, but for most users, you can just turn it on and walk away and it'll do the right thing. Um, sharding is sort of a, one of the big things that users struggle with. Um, so there's this pgnum thing in Ceph where um, the logical pools are broken into a number of shards um, distributed across the system. And picking the right number of shards for your workload is always just sort of a, a hard thing to explain to users. It has a lot of implications for performance or reliability um, and the quality of your data distribution, at least before. Um, and picking the right number was sort of a black magic. Um, there was a web-based tool that um, somebody wrote to sort of help you pick a number based on how much data you expected to store and how big your cluster is going to be and so on. But having sort of an external tool that you have to ask in order to set a configuration option was definitely not ideal. And the problem is that it was high stakes because if you pick a small number um, and you have to adjust it up, a lot of data has to move in order to change that sharding. Um, and if you pick a number that's too high, you can't actually reduce it. We implemented splitting, increasing, but not the harder, more difficult process of like unsharding and breaking and merging into smaller shards. Um, and so it's, it's difficult to automate. <laughs> and, and at the end of the day, this is just not something that a user should ever have to think about. You want storage that just works, so you don't have to like futzing around with these internal implementation details. Um, so we're, we're on the way to making pgnum a non-issue. Um, we hope to have some of this work done in Mimic, although it might be the next release. Um, so there's Rados work in progress to implement the, the merging, so that if you do make a bad decision, you can sort of fix it later. And also, we can do automation that sort of tries to tune this value for you. And if the automation makes a bad decision, it can correct later without sort of getting into a situation where it can't undo what it did. Um, so we're very excited about that. but there's more work to do. Um, and while I'm talking about manager, there's sort of one last piece of manager I want to mention, um, and that is something called the service map. Um, so Ceph has a number of different daemons, um, and some of them are they're, they're sort of part of the core system, um, but some of them aren't. So there's the, the Rados layer, and the way that we implemented the Rados gateway, it sort of consumes Rados, but it's not sort of as tightly integrated with the rest of the system. And so the service map is um, a generic facility that allows you to have other sort of additional daemons that you build um, report state back into the system and so that they can be observable by the administrator um, and so on. So, so daemons can report sort of static um, immutable metadata about you know, what the daemon is and what host it's running on and that sort of thing. And then they can also post status updates that say what their current status is, what their current task is, what their progress is, that sort of thing. So there are a couple of users that are sort of in core Ceph. Um, the Rados Gateway, which is the S3 compatibility component, is the first one. Um, so they report into the system so we know how many Rados Gateways are running and what zones they're currently serving and that sort of thing. Um, and the RBD mirroring daemon is another where it's handling the um, asynchronous DR replication of block devices to other clusters. Um, they can report into the system. And so that the simplest application of this is that when you do a Ceph-S, that sort of high-level information about running services is included in part of the services there, so you can tell how many RGW daemons are active and currently at. Um, but more importantly, there's also um, the ability to report more metadata than that about current status so that we can surface other information. 
So for example, the Rados gateway um, allows you to federate clusters across multiple data centers and asynchronous, asynchronously replicate. And one of the common complaints we got from users was it was really hard to tell whether that was working. Are they currently replicating data? Is the replica up to date? What's the current status? How much data, how quickly is the data moving? And one piece of that is um, having those daemons be able to report state into the manager where it can be exposed to manager modules that will surface it on a GUI or something like that. Um, which brings me to the last subject, um, which is managing your Ceph cluster. And um, this is the thing that, at the end of the day, we want to make sure that for operators using Ceph, it's as easy as possible. Um, and one of the biggest components that we added to Manager, and in fact, one of the sort of the driving motivations for building Manager the way we did, was the ability to have a built-in web dashboard that's part of the Ceph system, core Ceph, that's deployed with every Ceph release, um, that gives you a, a GUI to actually manage storage. Um, it turns out that in the enterprise world, there's sort of a, you know, Ceph was built by um, Linux administrators and developers, and so we sort of built it the way <laughs> um, uh, we thought it should be built with CLI interfaces and so on. Um, but in the enterprise world, um, storage is manager, managed by sort of a, a different breed of, um, of IT professional that's um, used to you doing point and click GUIs and forklift upgrades of enterprise storage and systems. And in, ultimately, in order to make Ceph successful, we needed to be able to make it easy enough that um, uh, that type of operator could manage the system. Um, so the dashboard is a web-based GUI that's um, built, in, built into Ceph. Um, it's a single command to enable it. It's deployed out of the box, and you just turn it on. Um, the front page is similar to the Ceph dash test, where it gives you a high-level view of what's going on. Um, but on, for, for block, you can see what the pools are and what images are and how much space is used, that sort of thing. For the Rados gateway, you can see what the zones and zone groups and how it's sort of the federation stuff is set up. And for the file system, you can see what the file systems are, what the daemons are, you know, how, what the metadata traffic is from clients, that sort of thing. So it, it's pretty basic. Um, it, was, it was really written as sort of a, a proof of concept. Um, but it's still like way better than what, what was there before. So here's a quick screenshot. It's nothing um, super amazing, like pretty basic um, design elements here. But you can see you have high-level status with health. You have your cluster log, um, information about your daemons, that sort of thing. And again, it was really designed for simplicity. Um, it, it's based on a framework called Rivets that is like very simple JavaScript um, framework with the idea that we wanted developers to be able to come along and be able to like hack up a change to it and like do an entry and have sort of a low barrier to entry. Um, and as act as a proving ground for shaking out the interfaces to make sure that all of the other Ceph plumbing is necessary is in place um, in order to surface something on a GUI. Um, so a good example of that is um, when Jason Dilliman, the RBD, um, lead went to add an RBD page to the dashboard to show what pools and what um, images are in place. He realized that it was sort of hard to figure out which of the Rados pools were used by RBD and had RBD images in them. Um, and that motivated a change to core Rados so that we could add um, application metadata to pools, so we could tag this pool as an RBD pool with certain metadata, and this pool is a CephFS pool associated with this file system and so on. Um, and part of this was motivated, um, this whole architecture of the Ceph manager, in fact, when it was sort of conceived um, by, by John Spray, one of the Ceph developers, um, was based on his experience of implementing an out-of-tree um, Ceph management framework. Uh, many years ago at Ink Tank, when he built Calamari, um, the architecture that they built made sense at the time, but they learned a lot about sort of the challenges with having something that's sitting outside of Ceph, poking at REST APIs in order to get state, in order to get them out, and there was performance issues and like big blobs of JSON moving back and forth, and it was just sort of, sort of um, not ideal. And so the architecture of the manager was largely motivated by how you could have a more tightly integrated and more performant and lightweight um, management development experience that, um, that worked. Um, so sort of the big recent news that I'm very excited to talk about is that um, OpenAttic, one of um, the most successful external management tools for um, managing Ceph, built by a, a team at SUSE, um, has sort of decided to converge roadmaps with, uh, with Ceph, Ceph dashboard. So there's a new consensus among um, Ceph developers to have a fully featured entry dashboard, that's sort of being dubbed dashboard v2 for the time being, um, that is hosted by the manager. So it's part of course Ceph. When you install Ceph, you'll get it out of the box. Um, and it's going to do all the, the client management stuff, like creating pools and managing RBD images and all that sort of stuff. Um, it's going to have a rich metrics set of dashboards um, built on Grafana dashboards. So um, OpenAttic has already built 
a lot of Grafana dashboards. Um, Red Hat had a project called Ceph Metrics that built a bunch of dashboards. Those are going to be sort of pulled into the dashboard that's part of Core Ceph. Um, and it's also going to do management tasks. So one of the first things that customers ask for is like, I have this, you know, 10 node Ceph cluster, I buy two more nodes, how do I add them into the system? Um, and that's one of the, the simplest sort of operations that you can imagine an IT person wanting to do. Um, and having the, manage, the management dashboard be able to handle that sort of thing or deploy onto a new node. Or things like, you know, a failed disk as replaced, be able to click something that says reprovision, you know, another OSD on the, on the replacement disk. Um, so this is um, a relatively new development. Um, so there's initial work that's taking the old dashboard and porting it to Angular 2, a more um, rich and featured um, JavaScript framework. Um, they're also taking the open attic um, back end that used to be sort of an external thing using REST APIs to talk to Ceph, um, porting that into the manager so it can take advantage of all the efficiencies and, and lightweight um, development that you get from that. Um, and as, as the feature sets of those two things converge, then it's going to become the new default. Um, so that with Mimic, hopefully, um, we're going to have a vastly improved uh, management experience that comes with Ceph out of the box and makes things, things much easier to use. So we're very excited about that. Um, provisioning and deployment is something that's um, often sort of hard for um, something that's sort of in Ceph to manage because it's sort of managing itself and provisioning itself as opposed to something that's sitting outside of it. Um, but the, the plan is to have that dashboard be able to reach outside to whatever the, the framework is that, that deployed Ceph in order to do those sorts of things. Um, so if Ceph is deployed in a Kubernetes OpenShift type environment, and it'll be reaching out to Kubernetes and say, go start up more daemons over here, or restart these containers, that sort of thing. Um, and on bare metal deployments, we plan to have some sort of limited hooks work in you know, SSH out to do some basic function like reprovisioning an OSD or something like that um, for, these, for these common tasks. Um, it's probably a good point, time to, to um, mention deployment tools. Um, so traditionally, um, or historically, Ceph had, a, had a, a simple CLI tool called Ceph Deploy. Very simple to use and very simple to understand, but it only really worked for small clusters um, because it wasn't really meant to be scalable. Um, but it was still a CLI tool, which is not sort of the best customer experience um, for, a lot of, for a lot of people, best user. So there, there are a lot of other tools that have grown up over time. Um, sort of the best um, two right now are, are Ceph Ansible, which is the one that sort of Red Hat has all its efforts behind. It's Ansible-based, it deploys current versions of Ceph on lots of nodes. Um, SUSE built a tool called DeepSea um, that basically very similar, but it's based on salt um, and also works well with the current version of Open Attic. Lots of other stuff there. Um, but what, we, what we've realized is that um, even these tools are like not, not necessarily what you, you want users. Like saying that um, telling a user that in order to install stuff they need to write an Ansible manifest in YAML is like not really a, a friendly user experience necessarily, especially when it's your first, your first step when deploying Ceph. Um, so there's a lot of work improvement that we can do here. And the biggest thing really is um, that question that we get is like, what about containers? Everybody's talking about containers. Um, so Ceph Ansible has some basic container support. It can run Ceph daemons in Docker containers. Um, but that's not really what people are usually asking about. What they really want is um, to use a container orchestrator like Kubernetes or Mesos, um, usually, usually Kubernetes. Um, and for a long time, um, for me at least, I would sort of ignored <laughs> this question because um, I was mostly focusing on the monitors and the OSDs, which are like managing the actual data on disk. And these container orchestration frameworks don't really have a lot to offer something that is sort of closely tied to a storage device. They're really designed for microservices that can move around on different nodes and can get killed and restarted somewhere else. And so it didn't really help Ceph problem, Ceph's problem of managing like the storage hardware. Um, and so because they weren't really offering me anything, I didn't really pay attention. Um, but it turns out that the Ceph um, collection of services is a, has a growing number of other services that are important, like the metadata servers, the Rados gateways, the um, NFS gateways, the iSCSI gateways, now Ceph Manager, the Mirror Demons, um, soon we'll have you know, Samba and all sorts of other stuff. And those are all stateless. They're just services that are re-exporting storage and sending over the network. Um, and when you start thinking about um, a lot of deployments where people want to um, install storage on a small number of nodes, maybe they only have like a four node or five node cluster, um, it becomes sort of a bin packing problem where you have to schedule all these different daemons and all these different services and trying to make sure that you're um, paying attention to the memory and CPU constraints and all that. Um, and it's, it doesn't make a lot of sense to have Ceph try to figure out that, that 
scheduling problem when that's actually exactly what these container frameworks are designed to do. Um, as well as help easing other things like, you know, upgrades of individual containers at a time, all that other stuff. Um, and the last thing is that a lot of um, uh, people really want to think of these um, orchestrators as sort of the new distributed operating system. So instead of thinking of your data center as sort of, you know, a bunch of Linux distros installed on each node and that's sort of the framework that you build everything else on top of, um, they think of deploying something like Kubernetes across all of your nodes and that's sort of the, the substrate across which all of your other infrastructure is based. So whether it's your, your software-defined storage that's getting scheduled across there or your user applications or you know, maybe even your OpenStack is deployed by Kubernetes. Um, a lot of people are doing. Um, it becomes really important for us to fit into that new world um, and take advantage of it. Um, so we, we run around in circles a lot with figuring out how to best run Ceph and containers when we sort of realize this is really important. We built a, um, there's like a Ceph Helm project that uses Helm charts to manage the, the, the demons um, directly. Um, but what we, what we eventually realized is that um, we needed a richer operator, um, something that was smarter and really understood Ceph in order to orchestrate the Ceph containers. Um, and that brought us around to a project called Rook um, that came out of Quantum recently, which is sort of a, a, a custom built operator for, for Kubernetes um, that is designed to run software defined storage systems, specifically Ceph. Um, so it uses native Kubernetes interfaces to talk, to tell Rook what to do. Um, so for um, all the things in the Kubernetes ecosystem, this is very natural. You just sort of declare that you want a cluster and it goes and it creates a cluster, um, that sort of thing. So it deploys Ceph clusters and it can also manage Ceph clusters to some extent by creating pools and plumbing them to Kubernetes applications, all that stuff. Um, but the key thing is that it's smart enough to manage those Ceph demons properly. Um, so for example, trying to use the, the raw Kubernetes primitives to um, manage monitors was challenging because it was hard to t teach Kubernetes not to stop you know, monitors if it's gonna break quorum and break the system or like move too many monitors at a time with, before they were able to replicate, that sort of thing. Um, whereas Rook, as, as a custom operator, um, we can put all the smarts in there to make sure it does all the right things. Um, similarly, um, upgrading from versions of Ceph, especially the major versions, is usually sort of a non-trivial task where you have certain settings that you have to set and things that you want to make sure get converted while you're doing that migration, um, the ordering that you upgrade demons and so on. There's, with every Ceph release, there's always sort of something that's a little bit different. Um, and so Rook, as sort of an external operator for the Ceph cluster, becomes a place where we can enshrine all of that knowledge about how to do that, oper that upgrade correctly and so that we can automate it and make it happen, happen for you. Um, so it's, it's great. It makes um, Ceph easy to use for Kubernetes and it's seen a lot of success sort of in the in the Kubernetes space, people really seem to like it a lot. Um, and so our, our current plan, at least, is to make Rook sort of the, the default choice for how you deploy Ceph, um, to make Rook the default choice for how you deploy Ceph in Kubernetes environments. Um, so we're pretty excited about that, and the community's been very responsive, and we're, we're working on a lot of changes to Rook to sort of make it do all the right things. So that's pretty exciting. Um, so I'll, I'll finish by talking just a little bit about Mimic, this release that's coming up. Um, so our, our attention is sort of across three main themes, um, management and containers, um, which I've sort of talked about, and also performance, which I haven't talked about, but NVMe is gonna be everywhere very soon, and there's a lot of work going on in Ceph to make it sort of as lightweight and high, fast and performant as possible. Um, so uh, I talked a bit about central config management that's coming in Mimic, um, all the Kubernetes deployments coming, vastly improved dashboard. Um, other things are um, like having progress bars for cluster operations. So like when you mark an OSD down and it has to migrate a bunch of data, like giving the user some like high level understanding of that it's halfway done and it'll be done in like two hours, that sort of thing is very helpful. I um, mean, PG merging I mentioned is something that we wanna uh, eventually get in there. Lots of other stuff sort of not on the usability front. Um, so there's a QoS um, beta that um, for RBD that will hopefully be in place soon. Um, CephFS snapshots have been around for a long time, but they'll be sort of declared stable in Mimic, which is very exciting. And we're starting work on having Ceph manage NFS gateways so that you can export CephFS via NFS for compatibility um, without sort of having to roll your own solution. And of course, lots and lots of performance work. Um, a new RGW front end, there's a lot of OSD refactoring going on right now, um, and we're moving towards um, some of these very high performance C++ frameworks, um, C star, uh, and DBDK and SBDK where we can um, have very, very good performance on the OSD data path um, so that we can make use of NVMe devices. So I encourage everyone to get involved in the Ceph project. Um, we're very friendly and we love, we love to hear from users, particularly feedback about the user experience, what, what it is about Ceph that you think is hard and what we can do to simplify that and make it easier. 
Um, lots of ways you can get involved. Um, we have mailing lists and GitHub, of course. We have a monthly developer call that anybody's invited to join just to listen or even to chime in if you have a, a feature or something that you'd like to work on. They're every month, they're on video chat blue jeans, and we alternate APAC friendly and EMEA friendly times. So every other month at least, you'll have like something you can do while you're still awake normally, which is good. Lots of meetups and stuff days. Um, there's a YouTube channel with hundreds of YouTube videos of past stuff events. So if you're looking for more information, you can always go there. Of course, you can follow us on Twitter. Um, but the big exciting thing is that we're having our first Ceph conference, um, Cephalocon um, APAC, which is in March, um, in a couple months in Beijing. So if you want to take a trip, I guess it's in a friendly time zone, although it's still pretty far from here. Um, but we would love to see you there. We're very excited about um, that Ceph event. Um, there's a URL, there's a, a call for papers if you want to, we're still accepting proposals for talks. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, this is sort of our ongoing battle to create a free and open source storage solution um, that works for everyone and requires minimal staff IT training. This is my two-year-old daughter here helping swap out an SSD. Um, so happy to take any questions. Thanks. Have we got any questions, anybody? You made them very happy, obviously. Thank you very much for your talk. Just wondering, um, with some of the things that are in Rook, uh, I imagine that some of those constraints that you're trying to program in probably are potentially something that another project could pick up. They're probably a little bit agnostic. Or is there any thoughts about potentially pushing that into Kubernetes itself or having that discussion with them, especially things like I've got f I need five or three of these. I don't need four. Four's bad. Um, you yeah. know, and being able to, to make that part of the Kubernetes framework instead or, or work with them. So um, I, I think so, yes. So Rook actually started almost a year and a half ago now. And there was a lot of stuff that Rook did early on um, that in sort of, if you look at Kubernetes today, wasn't necessary. And so they've ended up stripping a lot of things out. So a lot of sort of the, um, and I'm not a Kubernetes expert, so I can't really give a lot of good examples, but there have been a lot of pieces that have sort of gone away or been incorporated into core, um, into core Kubernetes. Um, uh, Rook is, yeah, so hopefully that's, that's the short answer, yeah. Yep. I'm intrigued by your move to creating a web interface and things as someone from a project that last ditched its web interface from, that we'd built in the 90s and said, actually, we're not web developers, we're systems programmers. Mm -hmm. um, how do you get, is, is this a game that we really should be getting, as, as Samba, we should be getting back into and how, more, which you can't really answer, but how, how, how would you encourage us that being back in the web game is a safe place to be as system programmers? Uh, that's, as, you know, rather that's than, a good I'm question. worried it will bit rot again. Yeah. yeah, I don't, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know that it's, it's always the right solution for sort of the core project to also build the GUI on top of it. I think for Ceph it makes a lot of sense because there's such a, a rich amount of information that has to flow between the GUI and the system is very hard to maintain all the APIs across versions and so on to, to do that in two different projects. And we sort of tried for years and just didn't have a very, we we're unsuccessful in building a real eco ecosystem around the management piece. Um, so I think it made a lot of sense for Ceph. It's, I don't know if it makes sense for other. Projects. I think I think the, the the key thing for me is that um, what is important is for projects to look at, take a holistic view at what is making it hard for users to use your system, and it's not sufficient to just say that's not my problem, um, because sometimes it is your problem, and there's nobody else that's really around to solve that that piece of the issue. So. Wonderful. Look, thank you very much for that, and on behalf of the wonderful people who are organising this conference, as we gift for you to say thank you for your time and efforts. Thank you very much. Thanks.